here with B, who you may recognise from a video that B and I filmed earlier on this year where B profiled Nathan and I. So B's invited us back for a round two of that video, but I'm not exactly sure what B has planned for me today. So I'm gonna hand over to B to introduce herself and to talk a little bit about what it is that she's gonna have me do this morning. So like Hannah said, um, my name's Bee. I'm the director of Volume 1 Climbing, but also the head performance coach here. So I train all of my instructors to the highest standard I possibly can so that the quality of instruction that we have here is hopefully next level. So what I noticed in profiling Hannah recently was um, some inefficient movement patterns that could be improved to help her reach her potential. So how I see this is there was an imbalance between her um, relative strength and fitness, which was actually exceptionally high in comparison to the grade that she's actually managed to achieve so far, especially on a rope. Considering how fit Hannah's forearm was in the testing that we did, I believe that if we can develop some more efficient movement patterns, she has the potential to be an amazing sport climber. So today I'm going to introduce Hannah to um, my technique board and a couple of the theories that I train all my staff in and we try and teach everybody at Volume 1 how to do to help them get the most out of climbing. Basically since I've been climbing for as long as I've been climbing, I've mostly bouldered. Um, but I think recently I've been kind of like more interested in moving into or thinking about trying to develop my sport. I think because maybe off the back of the test we did, I started to realise that actually relative to my other strengths, my endurance is quite good. And like for a boulderer, my endurance is quite good. I've done a few tests in the past and my kind of scores in that side of things have always been a little bit higher. So I'd be really interested to see whether or not B can tell me that there's hope uh, for me as a sport climber. Yeah, I'm excited to see what B has got planned for me today. We're actually going to start somewhere a little unusual for a climbing walk. I'm going to take you up to our new gym and we're going to start firing up some muscle groups that are going to really help you to get the, well, get the muscle spiring that I need in order to achieve these different techniques that we're going to go through. Okay, so we're going to use a ski erg to get you warmed up. This machine is amazing because it's a real full body workout. So the idea is if you stand on the platform and try and grab those handles, they are quite high up. Perfect. Okay, and now I want your feet just over shoulder width apart. And we're looking for relatively straight arms. And I want you to try and keep your back nice and straight and do big squat positions with your legs. So you're gonna drive down with your arms, but you're also gonna be doing deep squats with your legs. And I want you to imagine, I don't know if you've been skiing before. Not skiing, it's snowboard. It's snowboard. Not quite yeah, same. it's not like snowboard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also a snowboarder, so it doesn't really come in there. Help me either on that. So okay. imagine you are pulling the handles back behind you and throwing them behind you, but you're going to use your whole body like to generate that movement. Now, can you keep your arms straight? This relates to actually <laughs> something that we're going to do later as well. So can you use your whole body to pull those handles back without bending your arms? It's going to be a head game thing here. And squat at the same time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's a coordination thing, but it's also, it warms up every muscle mm -hmm. in your body. It's yeah. actually a good way to get you fired up for climbing. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So, thinking about what you learnt on there, mm -hmm. with how we use every muscle in our body to generate force and not just our biceps, mm -hmm. we're going to relate that to what we do downstairs. Okay. But I'm going to do just two more glute waking up exercises as well, okay. because we're going to do a lot of hip lifting when we're on the wall too. I would like you to lay on your back, and we're just going to do a couple of back bridge exercises. So, pushing... First of all, through your heels, mm -hmm. I want you to try and do a little bit of a pelvic tilt. So you're gonna tilt your hips and try and engage your deep core, lovely. Now, can you continue that lift up through your hips? So imagine I'm pulling your belly button up with a piece of string, brilliant. Now, from there, can you stabilize enough on one foot to lift one leg out in front of you? You might have to slightly shimmy your foot, brilliant. So what I'm looking for here is, can you keep your hips nice and level? So if you imagine there is a spirit yeah. level on your hips, lovely, and relax down, cool. So, I want you to remember that feeling, mm -hmm. and we're going to go down to the technique board and put that into practice. Okay. So, we're going to have a look at the same test that we did before we even started any of your profile and stuff. So, initially, I was looking at if I give you a challenge on this circuit board and ask you to just climb around it, mm -hmm. using the terminology your path of least resistance, what do you choose to climb, and how do you naturally move? We're going to do that again now, 
I know we haven't done any work together since our last one, so I'm not expecting <laughs> miracles from the few tips I gave you last time. But we're going to look at, are you using bicep abuse? Yeah. Are you placing your feet accurately? And what is your default movement pattern? This is good, this is already better than um, the last time I really did. <laughs> you did say you've been aware of it. Well, whenever I circuit board now, I'm like, I think about my arms a lot more. That's awesome. The key is that awareness. Like, even if you have that thing in your mind that says, am I over pulling? Oh, cool, rest on there. How does that feel? Yeah. How do your arms feel? Is there any pump? Do you feel like there was any bicep abuse there or are you quite relaxed? I feel like there was, but I feel fairly relaxed. Fairly relaxed. Cool. So, in terms of your choice of um, like the order in which you're moving, yeah. it's loads better now. So we talked a little bit about feet, hips, hands, and how you set your base before you move your hips and your hands over it. Yeah. And you're starting to do that really nicely. So something that you can even do low down on the wall here as part of an advanced warm up is practice the bucket theory whilst your feet are still on the ground. But you can also practice setting your base up. Right. So I do this with a lot of my clients as part of their warm up. Get them to just swing around, like warming up the hips, mm -hmm. and just practicing setting the feet first. And you'll soon realise if you're on the floor, if you're doing this and leaving your base behind, yeah. it feels really awkward. So it's a really nice um, warm up drill. Set yeah. the base, so it's feet, hips, hands. Feet, hips, hands. Sure. Yeah, I quite often find that I will get a bit ahead of myself on my arms and then have to do quite a like, awkward foot swap yeah. to bring my feet up to speed. So that's what we're going to talk about a lot more today okay. and that's what I noted on that, <coughs> on the story that you put out about the white. <laughs> I tried it with my theory, it is a really hard move, <laughs> like, I totally agree that it's absolutely nails to hold and the only way that I managed to do the move was setting my base wow. so far underneath me that when I came into the match, I could fall straight into the left hand. Yeah. And it was really cool to kind of put that into place that I think it's gonna work. Interesting. What we were doing there is practicing the rockovers. So that's staying on the inside edge, bringing the center of gravity over the pushing foot. Mm -hmm. As we start moving on to steep ground, it's obviously a lot more efficient to start twisting and getting the hips in close to the wall. Okay. Especially for people who struggle with the kind of open froggy leg position, to get the center of gravity close is quite challenging. So getting that twist, just allows us to get the body a lot closer. A really nice example of this on here is if I was reaching to that purple one and I went for my default method of rocking over, it's a quite powerful move. So if I do the same, exactly the same idea, but I drop the hip in, it yeah. then becomes an effortless twist. So that's what this lovely uh, pyramid or upside down volume, as I now like to call it, because it actually Check this out. I realised this at five o'clock this morning. It's just my logo upside down. So, using this base theory, yeah. I want you to try and do some drop knees, placing your feet in the kind of optimal stable pyramid position either side of the hand. So that's what this drawing is all about. I'm trying to encourage people to set the base in order to use the whole body and not have to bend and use bicep abuse in this chain. Have a little play on that. I want to see naturally what your body will do when it's trying to achieve a, a drop knee position. If you were to use this backhand, because we're going to come to that in a minute. Right, so if I had to try and use... So go left foot on the high yellow one. Cool, so what's the natural default here? Yeah, that's totally normal, and this is not um, unusual by any means, but I want you to see what would you have to do with your body in order to keep that pivoting arm straight. There's quite a few different pieces of this puzzle, but I want you to see what you can problem solve. Oh gosh. Um, keep the left hand on, get back into your same drop knee position. But think about what we did on the ground earlier and see what happens if you engage through the shoulder here but keep the arms straight and then lift through your glutes in the way that we did in that so bridge earlier. You gotta really my to push in. Yeah. Lovely. So it goes from being isolating a small muscle group yeah. 
to keep in this straight as a lever and using all yeah. the big muscles in your body to lift you up and pivot around that arm. Sure, because I'm definitely thinking get into position, crank the arm, mm -hmm. and then reach. Which is really commonly needed in climbing, especially for shorter climbers, because quite often we do need to pull that extra little bit to reach through. But my theory is if you learn to climb as efficiently as possible and you drill in movement patterns that aren't wasted energy, then when you do need that last little crank at the end, you're not pulling right from the start of the movement, you're getting as much efficiency through the chain and then that last little pull might be necessary to reach the hole. But it's quite often not if you set your feet in the right position. This is something that we could spend literally a month. Some of my clients, I work on this for a month with them until they get it dialed. So it's not something I'm expecting you to be able to click together in five minutes. But there are two key pieces of this puzzle that we haven't looked at yet. The pivoting arm and the steering arm. Now, what, when you took this steering arm off the wall, that's when you started to really struggle to not bend the arm. Because yeah. here, you were like, how am I going to generate movement to there? Even if I drop my knee, how am I going to get to that hold? There are two little pieces that can help here. This steering hand can help you draw your left hip into the wall, which is then gonna take some of the strain off the glutes and help you engage them in that position to then lift up. So what I want you to do is imagine that this is a lever. Mm -hmm. We can pivot around levers, but when they break, it's very hard to move around yep. them. So this becomes effortless when we're pivoting around on a lever, and it's gonna help you steer the hip in to then engage through the glutes and do what we were doing on the ground earlier another go and be aware of what that left hand is doing. Lovely. Cool, really strong. So that purple is actually quite far away for us. So to get the last little bit, you did do a tiny yeah. bend. I actually set more of the yellows for our height, okay. but I do sort of a combination. Uh -huh. um, so like if Nathan was doing, for example, he'd comfortably do purples because they're set to tall sure. purple. Um, so if you do the same movement, let's go hover two, three above the yellow. That's how I would train that. You want to really think about your glutes and think about engaging through the shoulders. Lovely. Cool. So can you feel how we've tried to relate the movement that you were learning upstairs yeah. with something on the wall? that if you get into a habit of using every muscle in your body rather than just your biceps, this whole chain is so strong. Yeah. And this is, you're used to walking around on your legs all day. Yeah. We can climb using the big muscles that are already full of strength and endurance. Yeah. These little guys, they've got everything left in the tank for that crux and whatever you need to do mm -hmm. when it comes to it. Yeah. So one of the really important things when you're learning to um, practice these drills. I didn't actually have to go through it much with you because your footwork's already really good, but a key area that people miss is the ability to pivot from the inside edge to the outside edge while they're dropping. That's part of the chain that if you lose it at that moment, the rest of the movement's not going to happen. So for example, if I place my left foot badly and I try and do a drop knee, I'm not able to rotate my ankle, I'm not able to get my knee in, and I'm going to push my own foot off the wall. So how I initially place that foot is essential to be able to rotate the ankle round and then in turn drop the knee and drop the hips. Now we've added another element to the puzzle. I want you to try and think here as well. Straight lines through the hips. Nice. And you're almost pushing back on that foothold. You're generating like a bridge-like stability. Lovely. Cool. Now the difference between a drop knee when we've got two footholds involved. This is kind of our ideal scenario because you're able to generate quite a lot of push and stability through those two feet. Mm -hmm. Our ideal situation really is that pyramid. Yeah. So if you were to stand like this and I pushed you over, you'd fall. If you stand like this, less likely to fall. Exact stability relates to climbing. If we do only have one foothold available though, that's when we have to start looking at flags. So that's what this dotted line here is for. We're gonna imagine now that we've only got this foothold so we're going to have to counterbalance and move further out to the side with a flagging leg to generate that same level of stability but still we're engaging through the shoulder, we're keeping the arm straight and we're lifting through the glutes and I want you to see if you can hold above that yellow hold there. 
imagine the flag in tow is holding a bit of paper against the wall. That's the level of engagement I want. And squeeze the glutes. Even straighter lines through the body. And you get this leg straight and can you get your left ankle close to the wall. Can you see how you're on your inside edge stuff? So how do we, yeah, like outside that. edge. Yeah. And now squeeze the glutes, straighten that left leg a little bit more. There we go. And then how close can we get that hip into the wall? Good effort. <laughs> Push through the little toe, straighten out the right leg. Yeah, good. Squeeze everything, lock it into place, hover and hold. Lovely. Cool. So can you feel how that engagement through the flag and toe is what locks together the similar feeling that we're getting with the drop knee, but when we've only got one foot hold. That contact with the toe is really important though. Same theory applies though. Pivoting arm, steering arm, yes. engagement, all the same principles apply, but you've just got one foot hold. So the last thing now, so we've done drop knees, we've done outside edge flags. Now let's have a look at inside edge flag. This is actually one of my favorite techniques and it is the one that is most underused and I think most valuable when it's ingrained into your movement patterns. It's just not ingrained into enough movement patterns yet. So, effectively, you're creating exactly the same shape with your body, but you're doing it on a different foot. So rather than stepping our outside edge here, we're gonna step our inside edge on the other leg. The other leg is gonna thud through and we're still making that same engagement with the toe, but it's onto the outside edge and we're lifting up through the body. This is where the glute work is gonna really start helping. Yeah, we're threading the leg inside, engaging still through the shoulders and the core, lift up through the glutes a little bit more. Can we get, imagine I'm pulling a bit of string, pulling your belly button in there. Lovely. Can you feel that difference? Yeah. When you visualise that string, it totally changed your body position. See, it's interesting because I would naturally, or well, no, maybe if I was going up not. If I ever flat, I'd be like that. Yep. But so, then I'd caught it and like. Well, that works really well if you've got a high foot hold. Right. So I like to think of it as um, inside edge, back flag, front flag. Sure. Yeah. If I was, I think that's quite a nice example of it up here. If I was to choose quite a high foot, I might pick a back flag. But if I'm on a low foot, there's plenty of room for that threading yeah. through and you can actually lock it into place a little bit more solid. Whereas behind, sometimes it's a little bit harder. You're going to be more inclined to pull if it's a big move and you're going behind. So have a little play around with some higher and lower footholds and see if you can see if you can link together that little pattern that I did there. So put steering hand. Back at the start, inside edge purple. <laughs> it's just because it's, it's not an ingrained movement pattern yet. This is totally what everyone does. Let's go yellow. And now can we go high left foot, yellow or, or purple. And then back flag there. Back flag maybe. Yep. So now, the desire to pull with the left arm to reach the next hold is quite high, yeah? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you were to pick a lower foothold and now inside edge, flag. Yeah, then you kind of pinch it. Okay. Yeah, so step it through, engage the glutes, and then suddenly the hold appears. Uh-huh, okay. Now see if you can do that another move. What happens if you get your right inside edge and the purple way out there? So there's your ingrained movement pattern of outside edge. So can we tell the brain, no, I want to be on my inside edge. Let's see what happens. Any amount of footwork is totally fine. So you use any feet you like to do the foot swaps. Okay, cool. So now, can we drive through the glutes now? This is a hard move because that foot's quite far out to the side. So you might find it easier to go on the yellow or the purple. Yeah. And now look through the hips, squeeze the bum. Cool. Can you feel it lock into place when you get the sweet spot? The glutes can lock. Look at that right arm. It's a tiny, yeah, just a tiny bit of bicep <laughs> use of the knee tap. But that's, that's totally normal and habitual. When it comes to linking them together, it's the difference in my mind between quite a complicated twisty dance and a very simple dance. I'm going to make all that myself now. If I'm doing an inside edge link together dance, it's going to look like this. It's a really simple movement pattern. 
If I'm doing an outside edge mixed together dance, it looks like this. So the difference in the complexity of the move and if you've got um, tight hips, people who have got um, less mobility, that's really challenging. So if you look at the difference, if I do a link together, of outside edge flags, it's quite challenging on my hips. It's still very efficient and effective, but for some people, that's going to be harder than a very simple dance where I'm keeping yeah. actually quite front on and away. Yeah. And for me, that, because I've practiced it quite a lot, is a lot more effortless than really having to twist through and do outside edges. See if you can give that a go. See how many moves you can link together on inside edge backs. It's a proper reprogramming, you know. <laughs> Blows people's minds every time. Lovely. And then step the left foot straight up and drive through. Look at the left arm. Good. Step the right foot up and drive straight through. Through the glute. Close. So obviously it's not efficient to force you to lock every muscle in your body and hover for a few seconds or even just to do it statically. So once you've ingrained that movement pattern and your body and mind knows what it feels like to get the end goal, I now want to go, what happens if we add a tiny bit of momentum into it? That steering arm, we touched on it at the top there, this steering hand is now going to make this whole movement completely effortless and I'm going to drive up with the right hand and almost swing my hips and make this as easy as I possibly can. That's kind of the final piece of the puzzle. Not everybody is ready to add that in because they'll just start naturally bending because it's just one step too far. Let's see what happens if we add a bit of momentum in, if you can really use that pivoting arm to stay so around that. Um, I was doing drop knees there, so let's go back to drop knees. Come on, Alex. How are you doing, mate? How are I give the description of when we're babies, the first thing we would try and do is pull ourselves up in our cot. And you'd probably be in this position, you're never going to be swinging around in your cot like this as a kid. <laughs> so even though it's very intuitive for young children to climb efficiently, we still have that natural instinct of safety is in bent arms. Yeah. But it's the most inefficient way, but it feels the strongest. Yeah. So we can reverse that virtual movement pattern yeah. of actually, this is more efficient, yeah. can I just flow around like a orangutan swinging through the trees? Can I apply that into my climbing yeah. and then be able to do 50, 20, 30 more moves? Yeah. Because I'd say with Lee, like, when you try and move over to me from bouldering, I've become even more, like, I, I climb like this when I'm bouldering, but, but when I'm, like, on the road, I'm scared as well, so I'm, like, even more accepted. That's, yeah. that's where the next level of training then comes in. It's going, yeah. okay, you know how to do this. How do we start learning how to do this under pressure? Yeah. When we're afraid, when we're above our cliff, when we desperately just want to yeah. clip like this. That's what takes a bit more practice, yeah. but totally possible. So thank you very much for watching. I'm going to leave B's social links in the description of this video. B runs coaching sessions and if you're in the market for some climbing coaching then I would definitely recommend a session with B. Thank you very much for her time today and for letting us come to volume one early in the morning. Now we're headed off to font. <laughs> so hopefully I can apply some of the techniques that B talked me through today to get up some problems in font. And I'll see you in the next video.